Welcome to another session of the grammatical theory lecture. Today we will deal with categorical grammar. Um, this is an overview of the whole uh, lecture. So we had some introduction, some phrase structure grammar and expar theory, government and binding, generalized phrase structure, an introduction to feature description, feature structures and models. Lexical functional grammar was the last session, and uh, today we are dealing with uh, categorical grammar. Um, the reading material is chapter eight of the uh, grammatical theory textbook. Um, again, we do not cover semantics in this uh, course, but if you're interested, uh, it's in the textbook. Um, of course, it's very important for all uh, syntactic series to have some idea how semantic connect, connects to the syntactic uh, structures, the syntactic theory, and categorical grammar is uh, very good in that. Uh, semanticists love it because it's, uh, it has a rather direct uh, relationship between syntax and semantics. Um, Categorical grammar is the second oldest uh, of the approaches discussed in, the, uh, in this lecture and in the grammatical theory textbook. So the oldest one is dependency grammar starting in 1800 something, but um, <clears throat> categorical grammar is also very old. It's uh, the, the first paper uh, was by a Polish uh, logician, Adjokiewicz, um, published in nine, 1935 <coughs> uh, in a German journal. Back then, scholars were writing in German as well. Uh, nowadays, the hotspots uh, are Edinburgh, Utrecht, and Amsterdam. And um, it, it's, well, many semanticists um, are using categorical grammar because it has a very direct uh, relation between syntax and semantics. Um, the, if you want to read overview articles or books that give you some idea uh, on what categorical grammar is and how central phenomena are dealt with this, you can read the work by Mark Steedman. Um, so that he has some very good um, syntactic articles and books. And there's also an overview article by Steedman and Baldridge um, that gives you some ideas. And I, I will also refer to this article when uh, discussing the phenomenon I discuss in, in, this, in these sessions. So the outline of this session uh, is uh, as follows. Uh, there will be general remarks on the representational format. That's what's coming next. Then I will cover uh, the analysis of verb position in German. So all these sessions refer to um, the analysis of German. We will talk about the analysis of verb position. German is a verb second language. Uh, and an SOV language. So there is something to say about uh, the analysis of verb position. Then there is, um, I will discuss local reordering of arguments, which is possible in German. Um, that's also known as scrambling this phenomenon. Then we will uh, discuss passive and long distance dependencies. And then I will give some summary and also uh, say, uh, a bit about problems and um, the relationship between um, categorical grammar and other theories like uh, construction grammar and minimalism. Okay, um, so the basic uh, foundational assumptions. Um, if we look at what was done so far in um, GPSG and to some extent also in LFG. Um, we had uh, phrase structure rules that were basically flat, right? So we had um, a, a VP rule uh, saying a VP may consist of a ditransitive verb and an NP and another NP or a VP may consist of a transitive verb and an NP. A VP may consist of an NP 
uh, of, a, of a verb taking an NP and a PP and uh, the NP and the PP. So um, we sort of have uh, the, the information about valence here uh, in this uh, label, so to say, and GPSG it is a number, one, two, three, four, five, um, and we have this information here in, in this, you know, in, in the symbols on the right hand side of the um, of the phrase. In um, category grammar, th this is uh, expressed differently. So instead of having it, uh, the information in the rule, um, the information is encoded in the lexicon. So the category for what could that be give uh, is something like that, right? So the the slash uh, notation says, okay, the, the stuff that is uh, put to the right of the slash uh, is required to be combined with this uh, unit. And then after this combination, we get uh, what is listed here. So um, that basically says we need to NPs to form a VP. So that's basically what this, the same as the rule here says. Um, the good thing is that uh, with such a, in, in such a setting, uh, we need very few, very abstract rules. So this is the first one, uh, it's called forward application. And it says, okay, if I have an X, um, with uh, slash y, so it's basically an x looking for a y, and I combine that with a y, then I get an x. So you see that that slash and and um, uh, asterisk here uh, reminds you uh, for um, on on multiplication, right? Like division and multiplication uh, in mathematics. Um, this, um, yeah, it's also called the multi multiplication rule. Okay, um, so that's easy. And the interesting thing is that we uh, have just one encoding for valence, and that's in the lexical items here. Uh, it's nowhere in the rules, right? So this is a very abstract uh, kind of rule. It says just take something that is requiring something else, combine that with something else, and then the, the first thing is happy, right? So you get a complete X. Um, okay. Um, the next thing, um, so, so, so what we um, had, so far is a forward application. So this um, rule, and we can look at an example of, of applying this, right? So that would be Chaste and Mary. Chaste is a, a VP looking for an NP. And here we have the NP. So if we combine that, surprise, surprise, uh, the result is uh, a VP, right? So this is done by, by forward application. And for this forward application, we have a little a symbol that's the arrow, arrow uh, indicating in which direction this uh, combination took place. Uh, so we get a VP by combining this is this thing, right? That's straightforward. Um, the interesting thing is that we don't need the category V any longer because we are only interested in the result of the combination. Um, now, there's th this, if you go back, if you look at this, this is uh, the way uh, category grammar derivations are stated. So it's, it's a proof basically, right? So you prove that you can derive a certain category by applying uh, these uh, combinatoric uh, operations. And that's maybe strange for you as a centractician who is uh, used to trees, but that can be depicted as a tree as well, right? So I show you uh, an example. Um, so this is uh, the tree with the category grammar symbols in it. So that says a VP looking for an NP, and then you have the NP node uh, as a sister node. 
And uh, if you combine the two, then you get a VP. So no problem, right? So you can translate these formats into each other. Um, there is a second way of combining things. Um, that's combining elements um, to, to the left, right? And it's called backward uh, application. Uh, and if we have that, we can replace uh, the VP by S backslash NP. So a VP is basically something, if you, if you think about English, uh, that is looking to looking for a subject to uh, the left of itself, right? And this is what um, backward application does. So we have an X looking for a Y to the left. So the, the, the slash here is in a different uh, direction. Before, uh, before that we had the slash in that direction, but now it's backwards. So it's a backslash. And the, the uh, argument, the, the thing we are looking for, the y, is to the left um, of the so-called functor, right? And the result of the combination is x again. So this is uh, the derivation of a complete sentence. Uh, the cat chased Mary. Um, so we have n, p, n, uh, combined uh, with n. So here, that's interesting, uh, in, in categorical grammar, we basically have a, a, what would be a DP analysis, although it's, it has a label NP here. Um, the, the determiner is the functor, right? So the the uh, selects the noun. So after this uh, combination, we get an NP, as you will see here. Um, so this is applied to that. This is the argument. Um, after the combination, we get the result of the at the left hand side of the slash. Um, then we have the verb chased, and this is looking for an NP to the right. Um, and after combining chased with Mary, we get an S backslash NP. So this is something looking for an NP to its left. And surprise, surprise, uh, we, when we combine this, this is NP at the left, we get a S. And that's the, the full sentence. That's what we want. Um, OK, uh, there is one interesting thing. Oh, well, there are lots of interesting things about category grammar, but one uh, thing that is interesting if you um, are coming from, from government and binding, for instance. So if you just did the exercise on X bar uh, theory or government and binding with the full X bar structures, then you may be really annoyed about, you know, going from N to N bar to NP or uh, dead, dead bar, dead p, uh, and things like that. Uh, in category grammar, you don't have to do that because there is just no difference between an intransitive verb that would be s backslash np or uh, a, a verb phrase containing a transitive or ditransitive verb because um, if you have a transitive verb combine it with an np you get uh, an s backslash np right and that's of course uh, also true for for noun phrases um so uh, we have what was our example like the das kommen des installateurs so uh, the the coming of the blah 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 or the father of blah 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 there you have an n combining with the PP to form an N bar, or if you have a non-relational noun, like the house uh, is nice or whatever, then you had N, N bar, uh, and, and then together with the determiner NP, but you don't need that in category grammar. So the cat will be an N, and um, if you have an N that takes an argument, you just say so, and after combining with this argument, you, you are an N. So there's no um, N bar 
uh, level needed in this kind of theory. That's also, um, it's, it's similar in, in more recent versions of uh, minimalism. Um, and there were tricks to do that in GB in the 80s. Uh, to do like a, like a lean version of X bar theory without these unary projections. But in category grammar, you didn't need them uh, in the first place. Okay, um, what about uh, modification? What about adjuncts? So um, in, in phrase structure grammar, we would have rules like the ones given here. Uh, VP uh, may consist of VP plus PP, or noun may consist of noun plus pp. Um, so th since this, these rules are recursive, we could have arbitrarily many pps uh, following a vp or following a noun. Um, if you look at categorical grammar and adjuncts, uh, how they look in, in categorical grammar in general, they have the form um, x backslash x or x slash x. That is, if you see that for the first time, it probably, uh, it's not that easy to understand, but uh, we will look at examples and uh, then uh, we, we come back to that because the, this general form is uh, important. So um, let's look at adjectives first. So this is our phrase structure rule, noun, a noun can consist of an adjective and a noun. And this is the lexical categorization of adjectives in categorical grammar. It says, okay, I'm something looking for a noun, something nominal to the right of me. And if I combine uh, with this thing, then uh, the result will be a noun again. That's easy, isn't it? So adjective plus something nominal is something nominal. Um, the post modifier of nouns like relative clauses or prepositional phrases are also n backslash n so that's just in a different direction so this category takes the noun to the left of it. Um, now it, it gets a little bit crazy when we are talking about uh, VP modifiers because the category representation is so complex. When I first saw that, um, I found it really difficult, but uh, if you really um, just instead of this uh, complex category, uh, think about VP, then, then it's uh, easier to understand. So this is basically a VP saying, I, I need a NP to the left of me and then I will be a sentence, right? Um, so the VP modifier will be something like that. It's uh, something that needs a VP to the left of it and the result is a VP again. So what you see here is um, the, derivation of uh, the sentence, the small cat chased Mary quickly around the garden. Um, and we have uh, the combination of small and cat. So that's the adjective as I explained, n slash n. And the adjective is looking for uh, the, the noun cat, something nominal and the combination is something nominal. Then we can combine the determiner with the noun and uh, the result of the application of the uh, here, uh, forward application is what is uh, given here on the left uh, of the slash, it's an NP. Now, the next thing is the combination of the transitive verb chased with Mary. And um, this is looking for an NP. Mary is the NP. And the result of the combination is S back, backslash NP. So that's what we have here. Now we have um, quickly the adverb. Uh, the adverb wants to modify a, a VP. Um, 
So it's looking for an S backslash NP to the left. This is what we have. And the result is S backslash NP, right? So here is the result. Here you can see the, the arrow is in a different direction. So this is forward application. This is backward application because this, uh, because of that backslash here, right? So now, um, there's something missing to have a, a complete sentence. Um, we have to integrate around the garden. And here you can see something interesting. Um, when we discuss the encoding of categories in government and binding with binary features, uh, we talked about adverbs and said that adverbs basically are intransitive prepositions. Um, so here you see how, how that can be encoded and how it uh, really, I mean, it's the same idea in categorical grammar. So the round here is a preposition and it says, okay, I want to have an NP to write of me. So this is uh, the garden. Um, the NP, the combined with garden, um, together it's NP. And if we combine this NP with round, with a preposition, we get something that has the same category uh, as quickly, because it's something looking for a VP to its left to form a VP. So the VP at the left is this, aspect slash NP, this is what we want, and the result is aspect slash NP. So here we have backward application, and the result is aspect slash NP. And now we are almost done. There is a subject here waiting for us, and uh, we are uh, um, a verb phrase that means an S looking for an NP to the left of it. So this is the S, and that's the end of the derivation. That's what we wanted. Okay, um, so this is a general setting. Um, now let's look at the set of phenomena um, of, of German grammar that we look at in all our sessions. The first thing that we want to look at is verb position. Um, there is some suggestion for this by Steedman for Dutch. So Dutch is like, like German, an SOV language and a verb second language. So um, the placement of the verb is basically the same as, as in German. So in uh, subordinated clauses, we have the verb in final position following the objects uh, in uh, questions and uh, assertion main clauses. Um, we have the verb in first or in second position respectively. So uh, Steedman suggested that uh, we have two versions of uh, the verb gav, uh, which is give or geben in German. And uh, the first thing is the verb final version. And he says, okay, that has a marking saying it's a subordinated uh, type of clause we derive with this. And um, the the NP object has to be to the left of the verb and the subject as well. And then we have a verb initial uh, GIF where we say, okay, the NP has to be to the right of the verb and uh, the next NP argument as well. And it's uh, uh, the, the, the sentence we, we derive is not subordinated. Um, the two lexical items are related by lexical rule. Um, so here we see um, a general pattern uh, with the series we, we looked at so far that uh, a lot of things that were done with uh, transformations uh, in, in government and binding are done with uh, lexical rules. Uh, in fact, the, uh, David Doughty pointed out in an early paper um, that lexical rules are 
equivalent to uh, to transformation to certain types of transformation. He called it lexically governed uh, transformations. Uh, okay, so so GB as transformations, uh, LFG and um, uh, categorical grammar, and as we will see, HPSG as well has uh, lexical rules. And um, then there was GPSG, uh, who used and and they used uh, meta rules for uh, many things, right? So that's a thing you have to remember for the exam later. Okay, so um, something I want to point out that is not obvious if you look at the um, example lexical items that were uh, given on the last slide. Um, the structure you get uh, with these uh, lexical items is different for uh, embedded and uh, uh, non-embedded clauses um, because the, the order of the arguments uh, ha has to be flipped, right? So it's not just that you flip the direction of combination, the direction of the slashes, but also you have to exchange the uh, nominative accusative order. The reason is that um, if you have um, normal order like nomin uh, nominative before accusative, then you have to combine the verb with nominative first in the verb initial sentence, but with nominative last in the verb final sentence. So here you have nominative um, together with a verb and it has to be outside, right? As, as a last uh, argument of the verb. And here it's accusative and the nominative has to be inside. So accusative is combined first and then nominative. So you have different structures for verb uh, final and verb initial sentences. And that's something that especially semanticists do not like. Uh, we talked about the analysis of uh, verb initial versus verb final sentences in the GB session. And there was the, there were these very old arguments uh, going back to Beerwish and, and others uh, for a verb final analysis of German and um, the one, one argument was uh, uh, from scope of adjuncts and if you have reversed tree order um, then maybe you can do it but it's not as simple as um, if you have the same kind of branching for initial and final uh, verbs. Um, there was uh, a suggestion in the literature, um, in categorical grammar literature, uh, by Joachim Jacobs, where he suggested basically something that is similar to the verb movement analysis. He suggested an empty element in final position. And this empty element acts like the verb. It takes the arguments of the verb. So we have the same branching structure. And then as the last element, uh, it takes the verb itself. So you have a, like if you have a, a sentence with a transitive verb taking two arguments, you have some empty element taking three arguments, namely uh, the two nominal arguments. And then as a third argument, the verb itself. The, Problem is that, uh, well, there are some problems with this and uh, we don't want to go in that in detail here, but you can um, read that up in the, in the textbook and in the references cited there. But uh, just to mention that there are analyses um, uh, that are similar to the GB analysis involving verb movement. We will also talk about the HPC analysis um, of um, verb initial clauses or verb second clauses. And that's basically um, similar. So you can do whatever you do in HPC, you can do in category grammar here. So we will come back to that uh, issue in the next session. Okay, what about local? reordering. Um, there's, uh, what, what you did so far is just um, 
sentences with a fixed order, right? So we had the, the slash pointing to, to the left or to the right. And uh, because of that, a, a, a lexical item basically says how the tree will look like. So the, the first argument has to go to the right and the second one to the left. That was what we did so far. Uh, but of course, there are other languages like English, uh, other, other languages than English, and they have different constituent order, and uh, many languages have a much freer order than uh, English does. Um, so Steepman and Baldrige looked at uh, various languages, and they uh, looked at languages in which the order of the combination doesn't matter. So you can first uh, combine with a nominative and then with an the accusative rather than uh, the other way around um, as it was for English or uh, another dimension in which there is variation is the direction of combination. So the, if you have languages where the head um, can combine towards the right or towards the left, so that can be uh, free as well. And uh, they came up with um, basically four types of languages. Uh, the first one is uh, English that we had uh, so far, uh, where we basically have SVO and the order is fixed, right? So we have the first NP to the left and then a second NP to the no, the other left to the right first, and then uh, the second NP to the left. And um, uh, then there's Latin, and they say, okay, we have sets for, for arguments. That means uh, we can take uh, elements out of the set in any order, because sets are not ordered. It's like um, if you have a bowl with fruit, uh, there is no first fruit, it's just a, or a bag or something, right? So it's, it's just uh, one container and you can take uh, out whatever you want. Um, and and the, um, the slash gives uh, information about the order, but if you have a, like a bar uh, without, so like, like for the Latin case, um, here without uh, order to the left or to the right, that means that uh, your head, your verb can be either to the left or to the right. And that is what Latin uh, allows so that you have basically free ordering. So the verb can be initial and then uh, nominative accusative or accusative nominative, or the verb can be in the middle or the verb can be at the end. Um, then there is uh, there are languages like Tagalog, um, where you you have a set, so you can have nominative and accusative, or accusative and nominative, um, and um, there there is the constraint that these have to the have to be to the right, right? So the the head the verb is initial, and the arguments have to be to the right, but in any order. And then there is Japanese, and Japanese is like German. It's an um, SOV language, a uh, head final language. Uh, so the head has to be to the right of uh, the arguments, but the arguments can be in any order. So it's a set, so you can take uh, um, the arguments out there in any order. Okay, this is also the analysis that is assumed uh, in HPSG for Japanese um, since Takao Gunji's work in 86. Okay, the next thing we want to look at is passive. Um, the solution or the analysis uh, of the passive that was suggested by David Doughty is um, uh, a, a lexical rule. So here we have uh, what he discussed in his 2003 paper that says if we have something, some element uh, alpha, um, some, some item alpha that is of the category um, transitive verb, so like something that takes an NP to the right and an NP to the left, then there is also something in a lexicon um, that is basically like alpha, 
but the uh, the past participle form of it and um this is in the category uh, past participle uh, slash np by. So this is basically a by pp or the von pp in German. And um, as an example, you can look at touch and touched. So s uh, and two np's, a transitive verb, um, is basically the input of the lexical rule, and the output is a pass. Uh, passive participle uh, form uh, the uh, respective um, participle um, phonology and uh, looking for an NP uh, that is marked by by. So what can we do with that? That would be a uh, derivation um, by Mary uh, the NP by takes as an argument an NP. This is Mary uh, combined by forward uh, application uh, gives us an NP by. Uh, the touched is derived by lexical rule, so this is indicated here, um, is a past participle once combined with NP by. Here is the NP by together forward application that is um, past participle. And then we have an auxiliary. Uh, selecting for this past participle and once it's it has this it's a VP that is it selects an NP to the left of it so combining this with a past participle we get s backslash NP and here's the NP we are looking for so in total we have derived an s that's it uh, passive well the question is, uh, what do we do with German? Um, in, in German, we can reorder arguments as we just discussed. So that would be the lexical item for Lieben. So it has this, uh, these sets, uh, argument sets. And um, for uh, Geliebt, we would derive something like like this passive version, uh, NP, uh, the, the accusative is now nominative and uh, we need a font PP. Um, uh, so as you see, this is a, is a, um, a different analysis from what we saw so far for, for English. So we would have different uh, analysis for German and English. That it's, it's not so nice. Um, okay. Um, and what I didn't say uh, here is that this um, passive lexical rule that would not work for uh, ditransitive verbs for verbs with uh, prepositional arguments. So the English rule would have to be generalized as well. But uh, in the end, we have different rules for different languages. And um, maybe that can be generalized, but it's uh, not obvious. Okay, the next part of the session deals with long distance dependencies. Um, we need some additional tools for that. Uh, they are called type raising and uh, composition. And what we have so far is rather simple, I think. And so, so my experience is that students love that. Uh, so um, most get uh, category grammar analyses right in, in exams. Um, and I never ask for any derivations with uh, type shifting, uh, type raising, and uh, forward composition. So um, if you just learn for the exam, you can stop watching the video here. Um, YouTube makes it possible to see um, when uh, viewers stop viewing a video. So maybe so the idea is that you then learn something about uh, doing videos and uh, how to keep them exciting all the way down um, i guess 
what I will see here is that the um, viewing rate drops at this moment and that will make me very sad. So you should watch it till the end. It's very exciting to see how this uh, composition take uh, works and um, how type raising works and you can do a lot of funny things that you can't do in the other frameworks. Um, so it's worth continue to watch this video and there will be some um, comparison with other uh, frameworks in the end so keep watching um, okay so uh, the one interesting point about the analysis of long distance dependency is that um, it works without movement so there's no like transformation and transformation and grammar and there are no empty elements it's just logic right so logical combinations and it works so like magic let's see so what steedman looks at is uh, examples like the one in 201 uh, these apples harry must have been eating and apples which harry devours so here again um, these apples is an object of eating and apple or, or which is an object of devours and they appear initially and this is something uh, grammar theories have to account for. How do we do it? Um, in categorical grammar it is assumed that Harry must have been eating uh, is just an, an S, uh, or and also Harry devours, is just an S lacking an NP. That's basically what we also said in GPSG, right? So we have a, um, an S and we somehow recorded uh, the fact that an NP is missing. Um, the problem is that we cannot derive that in, in categorical grammar uh, in the way it's set up now because the eating first needs that uh, object and uh, without the object it cannot combine with all the other stuff so we need some tricks and the trick well two tricks uh, the first trick is uh, type raising and the other trick is composition so let's have a look at type raising. Um, so um, if, you, if you look at uh, what you have here in 202, that is basically um, what we had so far, a VP um, and something that is an S provided we have an NP to the right. Uh, is uh, combined with the NP and the result is an S. So this, this thing selects for an NP. Now the trick is that we can change the category of NP in such a way that, that changes the, the, the question where, uh, who is the, the selector, right? So we just turn um, the NP <coughs> into something that selects for an s backslash np and the result of the combination is what whatever we want it to be in that case we want the result to be an s so we say okay if if we take that we are an np right and we take something that looks for us and uh in backward combination and um we take that and say, we, as a result, we will get that uh, thing that would have been the result here. So that is uh, what, what um, type raising gives you. Uh, to, to give you some other example, so we have, um, let's transfer it to the, to the human world, right? So we have some, uh, some cliche. Uh, so this is a, a, a male, looking for a woman and this is a woman and um so they sort of want to combine or the 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 cliche uh stuck male once uh sees it as his uh, uh obligation to select this woman but it doesn't work uh, he is too shy and then the woman says hey why don't 
we why should we stick to these cliches? Let's do it the other way around. So I'm looking for somebody who is uh, looking for me, and the result will be the same in the end, right? So this is this uh, guy, uh, and this is the 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 modern woman, and says, okay, I'm looking for somebody who is looking for me to form something and uh, a gang or whatever, and um, a reading group, and uh, then uh, the result is the same. So if you look, this uh, S backslash NP is uh, what is looked for. Here you have it, and the result is uh, the reading, the S stands for <laughs> syntax reading group, right? So that's the, um, the result of the combination. As our former way back, Chancellor said one time, uh, wichtig is was hinten rauskommt. So um, it, it doesn't matter what the labels are. Uh, in the end, it's uh, important that everybody is happy and that you have a syntax reading group, right? So the, the result is the same in both uh, combinations and the label of that thing um, doesn't really matter, uh, provided you are careful in setting up the labels. Okay, so uh, I hope I didn't confuse you by the uh, analogy. If I did, just uh, ignore it and read what is on the slide. Um, okay, so this this was the functor so far, right, in this combination, and uh, we turn that thing into, uh, and, and this is the argument, and we turn that thing uh, into the functor, and uh, the VP into an argument. So that's a trick about type reading. Good, now the second thing we need is uh, forward and backward composition. Um, the, uh, the definitions are given here. The symbol is the arrow with a B. And uh, I will just explain one of these composition modes, um, the forward composition. So what we had so far is, uh, and if you have a, a functor with an argument, so X uh, selecting for Y, and we combine it with Y, then we got an X. So that's what we have so far. This is um, uh, a little bit more complicated. Um, it says, I, I, I'm looking for a Y, but I don't have a Y. Um, I have a, I, I almost have a Y. It's, it's a Y, but uh, it's still looking for a Z, right? So, so in, well, well-behaved humans, if they want to buy something um, and, and they are just lacking uh, 10,000 euros, then they wait till they got the 10,000 euros. But there are uh, more impatient people who just buy stuff anyway and then have, have to care for the 10,000 euros later. So that's something like that, right? So, so we, we have the Y, but we are still missing the Z. And uh, we just ignore, sort of ignore the fact that we are missing the Z and do the combination anyway and what we get is an x but we are still lacking the z right so we have to take care of uh, getting the 10000 euro and give it to this uh, person who wants it um so this is forward composition right we we can combine stuff um even though uh, the the thing we are looking at is not complete yet so with this um forward composition we can um, we can now analyze our example and pass this information about the missing NP on to the top level. Let's have a look how that works. Um, the first thing we have here is the type raising, right? So we we don't have an NP for Harry but a type raised version. Uh, saying uh, I, I want to have a something that um, I want to have a VP to the right of me and then I will be a, a sentence when I see that VP. And um, 
the, the lexical items of these auxiliaries says, say, okay, um, I want a VP of a certain type, right? So must want to have a VP, um, a bare infinitive VP. So that's have, have wants to have a pass participle form um, VP, that's been, and um, uh, been wants to have a VP uh, with an in form, and that would be eating apples or something, right? Eating apples, uh, been eating apples, have been eating apples, must have been eating apples. So that's what we uh, would expect normally. Um, but now we play with tricks and uh, with composition. So Harry uh, is combined with must. So we we do the composition here, the combination, even though the VP is missing, right? So we get something that is an S um, looking for the VP at the right. And here you see arrow B, right? That's a, a combination. Um, then we have uh, the, again, uh, composition with, uh, with have, so uh, we are looking for a VP, uh, but we only have a VP looking for something else, but we nevertheless do the combination. We get an S slash VPN. Uh, we can again do combination uh, like composition with the bean. We get something looking for, for a VP in, and we can do it again uh, with the eating. We get an S slash NP. So that's cool, isn't it? So that basically says, um, okay, we have a sentence, but the sentence is lacking an NP. And we got that because we are allowed these, uh, to do these combinations uh, before combining the eating with an NP, right? So, so because there is no NP, we, we would be stuck otherwise without these combinations. So what is interesting is that this doesn't uh, uh, reflect the normal constituents that other syntactic uh, series would assume. Uh, Steedman has papers where he says, okay, you need that for coordination, these kind of uh, non-standard constituents. And there's information structure issues that that uh, correspond to these um, constituents. Okay, so we are at that point, but hmm, this wants an NP to the right of it, but the apples are fronted, right? So that's wrong. So how do we do that combination? That doesn't work. Hmm, we need one more trick. And the, the trick is that we turn that into a functor. So this is something that selects for that item. So this is a rule that uh, Steedman uh, suggests. For every X, we also have um, an ST uh, selecting for an S missing the X. This ST stands for a sentence with topicalization. And here he says what X could be, right? So if, if we, we are looking at an NP right now, uh, so the rule can apply and the ST is looking for a sentence missing an, an NP to the right. But that also works for PPs, VPs, APs, and S bars. So applying this rule um, gives us this, uh, category for these apples and um, that that can now be combined with what we have here right so this is the same uh, that we don't go over the derivation again that's uh, what we just saw but now we can combine these two things and ray uh, the result is uh, an s with topicalization now uh, the interesting thing is that that what we, we saw so far was uh, a long distance dependency with a set of VPs, um, but that was within one clause. But um, 
that also works ac uh, across clause boundaries. So to see that, uh, let's add, let's have a look at this examples. Uh, example, apples, I believe that Harry eats. Again, eat is a transitive verb. Uh, the object should be here. And what do we need for that? We need the type shifting here that turns the, the pronoun I into a functor. And then we do some composition. Um, that's I combined with belief uh, give us, gives us uh, an S looking for an S bar. Uh, the S bar um, is what we have here at the that. Um, but before we do these combinations, we, we uh, well, it doesn't matter as a proof, right? So we can do it in any order. Um, so, but here in this derivation, we combine Harry with Eats. Again, uh, composition, S backslash NP with S backslash NP. Uh, and we get uh, S backslash NP. So that's that S and that NP. And we can combine uh, the that with, um, uh, with I believe that gives us S backslash N, uh, X slash N. And here again, we can do composition. Um, we get S slash NP and this matches the requirement of this topicalized uh, apples and we get uh, S topicalized here as a result. Right, so you see by doing these tricks with composition, we can uh, cross clause boundaries here. Okay. Um, now, there's a problem. Um, if we remember um, GPHG style analysis, um, it was easy to extract things out of the middle of a dependency. So if we have, um, or out of, out of the middle of a verb phrase. So if you have an empty element and just record where it uh, occurs, then we can uh, analyze things like FIDO we put downstairs um, by just assuming that there is something missing and then we pass on that uh, information about the missing constituents. Um, in uh, categorical grammar, we have a problem because um, the, the analysis would look like, or does look in the end, like, like what is given here. Fido we put downstairs, so that's again a type raised V, but um, there are some problems. We don't have that category. Yeah, so, so combining we uh, with, with put would give uh, something that is S uh, slash PPNP. Um, and uh, the, the uh, combination then um, would, with this would result in um, something fronted with uh, PP missing and the PP would be combined in the last step, right? So we cannot combine it here uh, because if we would allow for switching the order there, then we would predict that it can be, uh, the order can be switched in uh, normal sentences without extraction as well, which is not the case. So, so this is the problem that we don't have this uh, uh, category. And um, the, so this is more complex than what we got so far, right? And um, we, the, the other thing is that we cannot combine uh, these two things with each other because we only uh, could combine things that, that we're looking for one argument. So in order to fix that, we need two uh, further extensions. Um, the first thing, is uh, even worse than what we did so far, right? So we uh, we wanted to buy something, but we're lacking 10,000 euro. 
we bought it nevertheless and we are stuck with the 10,000 euro. Now we are looking for two things. So we need 10,000 euro from one friend and another 20,000 euro from another friend. And um, uh, so we, we have a special combination rule that allows us, uh, so we are looking for a Y and that allows us to buy, to get the Y, to combine us with the Y, even though we are looking for two further things. And after the combination, we have something that is lacking these two further things, right? So we need this forward composition um, with uh, two missing uh, items. And um, uh, for topicalization, we also need uh, an, another case, namely um, topicalization for, for n equals two. So we have something that is an x2 and we turn it into something um, that is a topicalized sentence, but is still looking for an x1 uh, provided we combine ourselves with an um, uh, S looking for an X1 uh, and looking for ourselves. So this is the, the trick we need to um, be able to combine with something that is still looking for the PP. Because the problem is that, that the extracted NP is in the middle and the PP has to be combined at the very end with the result of the topicalization. So we have this very special um, topicalization rule. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what I just explained. We have that as uh, uh, a functor uh, as a result of the combination. Uh, provided we have uh, something, we, we combine with something that is um, selecting the x, x2 that was the input of the topicalization rule. So this is uh, the analysis that we get. So if you look at this, you, you think, boah, okay. Um, let's see. This is this is what you get from the topicalization rule, right? We are looking for something that is still looking for the PP. That's the the thing way uh, outside to the right, and uh, this is um, the thing that is topicalized. So the V is type raised, um, and we can combine it with a put. Uh, with this double or, or uh, uh, scale two or N2 uh, composition type. And we have two things that we have to provide, right? So um, after this combination, we get an S uh, here that has to be combined with a PP and an NP. And this is now the category that we can use here, right? So that's a trick. And we still, after this combination, we get this. And that is uh, what we need. That's the PP that is dangling here uh, that we then can combine in the last step. So that is rather complex. And it gives us unusual constituent structures, or so to say constituents. Okay, um, to, uh, this, this brings us to the last part of the talk, uh, the session, summary and classification. Um, I want to point you to three special things. So the comparison between lexical and phrasal approaches, um, headless constructions and relative clauses and non-local dependencies. Um, and um, yeah, that helps us comparing this framework with other series. Um, in GPSG, we looked in, in the GPSG session, we looked at a phrasal approach um, where we just had uh, flat phrase structure rules uh, combining a verb with a certain number uh, with 
arguments that were uh, provided by the respective rule. We saw that there were problems, namely this morphology, uh, with partial fronting, and um, also with complexity. The, the problem with morphology was that uh, morphology has to be able to uh, look at valence. So there are morphological rules that say, um, I want there to be an accusative object. If you have just a number as in GPHG and you don't know uh, what kind of arguments there are, then you cannot uh, formulate these rules in an insightful way. Um, partial fronting was also problematic because if the arguments are just introduced in the rule, in the configuration, then um, you cannot make sure that uh, the arguments that are not realized in the fronting, in the forefeld, are realized in the middle field. So you have to somehow know which arguments are realized and uh, realize the rest of the arguments. So the, the, the burden cannot be put on the, on the phrase structure. It has to be somehow related uh, to, to the verbs. And what the uh, people suggested back then was um, that basically Jabon, not John Nabon and um, Mark Johnson suggested uh, a categorical grammar analysis. So what you saw here in this lecture uh, basically is a solution to the GPC problems and Paulina Jacobson also pointed that out in um, with respect to other phenomena in, in her review of the GPC book. And um, so, so categorical grammar um, solves many of the problems that um, GPHG had. Uh, it brings some new problems <clears throat> and the solution of all these problems um, uh, is, I believe, uh, the assumption of HPHG, which we will deal with uh, in uh, the next the next lecture um, the the problems of uh, the phrasal approach uh, in, in GPSC also carry over to uh, phrasal approaches in construction grammar um, not all uh, construction grammar analysis assume that but a lot of them assume that that uh, you have basically phrasal uh, configurations and uh, that the arguments are licensed by the phrasal construction and that, that gives you problems with uh, morphology and with partial fronting. There is an extended discussion of, of the issues that are related to, to this um, phrasal or lexical uh, discussion. Uh, you can read up on this on Muller and Wechsler, uh, that's a, that was a target article in a, a peer-reviewed journal. And there were answers uh, to this by Hans Boas and Adele Goldberg and uh, many other uh, famous people. And uh, Steve Wechsler and I had the chance to reply to them uh, in a second paper. So if you're interested in this discussion, you can read uh, uh, up this article, have a look there. Uh, and there is a, a sort of ex extended version of this uh, in the grammar theory textbook as well um, in, in the second part. So chapter 21 deals with that issue. Um, if you, one of the arguments for phrasal approaches um, and by construction grammarians is uh, that they say, okay, language acquisition works pattern based. So we have a certain pattern, subject, verb, object, um, and uh, it's obvious that children learn these patterns. Uh, but if you really compare that, if you, if you know how lexical uh, theories work, um, then, then you see that you can do the same and you can explain the same language acquisition facts in uh, lexicalist ways. Um, so, uh, for instance, Tomasello talks about uh, papers, uh, uh, about patterns uh, of the kind subject, verb, object. Um, and if you, 
if you look at the little tree here with the categorical grammar derivation, you see that this pattern, subject, verb, object, is completely determined by the lexical item uh, SNP. Uh, NP, right, with NP to the right, NP to the left. So it's the 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 head functor uh, encoding of categorical grammar basically uh, encodes trees. So construction grammar says, okay, we have a verb that enters a certain structure, and by entering the structure, uh, it it the the realization of arguments follows. And the same can be said about uh, in, in a categorical grammar setting where you say, okay, a certain verb has a, a certain valence class uh, like the one that is given here. And by assuming this valence class, it uh, uh, can appear in a certain number of trees. Actually, it's even better because um, this pattern is a pattern of three things, right? Um, category grammar leaves us a little bit of space, so it doesn't specify the exact tree, but rather a class of trees. So it also allows this. The dolphin severely attacks the shark. So the, the functor argument encoding here says, okay, I need an NP to the right, and then I will be a VP, and look, here's this adjunct, right? So it, it interferes here and says, okay, I want to modify a VP. And this head doesn't know anything about adjuncts. It doesn't have to, right? And the adjunct says uh, what the result of the combination will be. It will be a VP. And this still uh, looks for the subject and we get a clause. So this, for, for this approach, it's sort of mysterical that there can be adjuncts here or there, right? Uh, it, it's not part of that model. So um, of course you can say, okay, these patterns can be discontinuous, but then how, how big can the gaps in between the things be? So um, in the end, you will have, you, what, what all this language acquisition series will end up is uh, dependency structures uh, that is, this is what uh, learners have to acquire, and that's what you have here also in the uh, in the category model, category grammar model, and uh, in the way you want to have it. Now, um, that seems very cool. So you can do things you want to do, but there are also some problems. So category grammar has very few combinatorial schemata, and they all assume that there's a functor and an argument. Um, but there are certain constructions where it's difficult or maybe even impossible to argue for a head. So an example is the NPN construction uh, demonstrated in 208, uh, student after student left the room or day after day after day went by, but I never found the courage to talk to her. Um, the, the point is that these things are very strange. They, um, the, the determiners are lacking. Um, the semantics of this uh, is completely different from uh, what you would expect if you would have a compositional X bar type of structure. Um, uh, that wouldn't work out. And uh, as you see here, day after day after day, you can even have uh, more than, than two. Ah, and and the, the, the first N has to be the same as the second N, right? There may be adjectives in there. So it's, um, it's complex. And what construction grammarians like Jackendorf uh, argue is that this is a construction in the construction grammar uh, sense of a phrasal schema without one thing being the head. And I think that's true. And if it is true, then this is a problem for theories like minimalism, uh, category grammar, and dependency grammar uh, who need there to be a head. There's one interesting uh, exception that is word grammar. Uh, which is a variant of dependency grammar. Um, we, we, I'm, I'm working on a handbook on HPC, 
uh, together with uh, three other editors. And we had Dick Hudson writing a chapter comparing HPSG and uh, uh, dependency grammar. And I said, yeah, but you cannot do uh, these um, uh, NPN constructions in dependency grammar. And then he said, yes, I can here. Uh, and he did designed an analysis for that, but that it's, it's specific for word grammar because he can do interesting things in word grammar with his uh, networks that are different from what people usually claim and do in dependency grammar. So the point is minimalism, categorical grammar, dependency grammar can't do it. Uh, GPSG, construction grammar, HPSG, LFG, and TAG can do it uh, because they are less restrictive uh, as far as structures in general are concerned. So there can be headless uh, structures. And uh, as the data seems to, to suggest, uh, this is what we want. Um, Okay, one final point uh, concerns uh, relative clauses. Um, in their introduction to categorical grammar, Steepman and Baldrige uh, discussed the example in 209, the relative clause, the man that many says Anna married. And they say, okay, the lexical item for the relative pronoun is this. So what that says is, um, I'm a model modifier of a noun. So that's what we looked at before, right? So that's uh, like the adjective, but it takes the noun uh, to, to the left of the relative clause. And uh, I'm, as a relative pronoun, looking for uh, a sentence missing an NP. So basically the relative pronoun says, I'm looking for a sentence in which I'm missing. Um, so this is the analysis of the relative clause. So many is uh, type raised, Anna is type raised, um, and we do some composition. So many combines with says. Uh, as a result, we have a sentence looking for a sentence. Um, Anna is combined with Mary. We do not have the object here. But do the combination, we have an S looking for an NP, missing an NP. Again, we can do uh, forward composition. Um, we get an uh, S lacking an NP. And here we have the relative pronoun saying, okay, I want an S missing an NP, and then I'm a noun modifier. So that's what's happening here. Done, okay, so that looks cool, but there are certain problems. Uh, Karl Pollard pointed that out in 88. Um, if the relative pronoun is ahead, there are problems with pipe piping. So um, the examples he discusses uh, are given here in 211. Uh, here's the minister in the middle of whose ceremony the dog barked. So we, what we see here is um, the, the uh, sentence in, an, in, in non-relative clause order would be the dog barked in the middle of uh, whatever Peter's ceremony. Uh, and in relative clauses, a phrase containing a relative word is fronted. What you see here is that the whose uh, is the determiner of that noun. The NP is contained in a prepositional phrase. Uh, the prepositional phrase is uh, part of a bigger NP, and this bigger NP is uh, part of a bigger PP. Um, the, the phenomenon as such, pipe piping, uh, was first described by Hedge Ross. Um, so this is his example, uh, reports the height of the lettering of the covers of which the government, the government prescribes should be abolished. So also, um, reports should be abolished where the uh, government describes the height of the lettering of the covers, covers of these reports. Um, so what you see here is that 
that this thing here is really deeply embedded. That's a relative clause, a relative pronoun. If you want to make that um, relative pronoun here the head of the relative clause, that seems just wrong. I mean, a lot of linguists won't share that uh, intuition. Um, Glenn Morrill and Mark Steedman came up with solutions to uh, suggestions how to do that. And um, they, they have to do with, with recategorizations of uh, relative pronouns and of also composition of, of this material, right? So you can, uh, by using composition, you can form one constituent out of this complex stuff here. Um, uh, so it can be done, but you have to extend the, uh, the formal tools again. And I think it's ugly and um, it doesn't, doesn't seem right. Um, the, what you do in other series like, like GPSG or um, HPSG is that you say, okay, there is some non-local dependency here. Uh, you have to sort of know about the, the WH word here and you just pass this information up uh, with inside that uh, phrase and then you say okay a relative clause is a, a clause where you extract something and you have a filler and that filler has to contain uh, 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 somehow somewhere uh, a relative word. So that's that's what uh, you would want to say in a theory neutral way and uh, in just assuming that there's a second kind of non-local dependency passing this information up seems to be a, a, a natural way to say that. Okay, to sum up, um, uh, categorical grammar has very simple combinatory rules. It's always functor based and uh, non-local dependencies can be done without empty elements but with uh, composition rules. This results in unusual constituents but Steepman argues that they are needed for coordination and information structure. The homework this time uh, is uh, simple I think um, so you should think about the analysis of uh, the sentence in 212 so that's English um, uh, I didn't choose a German example because German has all that head uh, movement verb in initial position and uh, extraction uh, so that's not the case here for for English it's a, just an SVO sentence um, so you you wouldn't need the uh, type shifting stuff being discussed in a second part. Okay, this was it for today. Thanks for watching. Um, the next session will be about head driven phrase structure grammar, um, where we basically then combine what you saw so far uh, in the lecture on GPSG and also on categorical grammar this time. So see you in a week or in a minute.